Greetings, everyone. Jonathan Alexander here with the Los Angeles Review of Books. And I am delighted today to have not just one, but two guests. Uh, our author today is Adib Karam, who is the author of uh, Darius the Great is Not Okay, and its sequel, Darius the Great Deserves Better, two absolutely amazing books about uh, the Persian-American cultural experience. And I've also asked my dear friend, Nazreen Rahimiyeh, who is professor of comparative literature at the University of California, Irvine, and really one of our national experts on uh, Persian-American diasporic writing to join us. So thank you both for taking some time to chat. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So I'm going to start by saying that as soon as I, I read uh, the first Darius book, uh, I immediately thought, my dear friend Nazreen has to read this book, uh, in part not only because it deals with a, a, a young Persian-American man and his family traveling to uh, Iran uh, to, to visit with, with family, but also deals really, I think, beautifully with some of the complexities of growing up uh, in a mixed cultural heritage household, uh, because Darius's dad is, uh, you know, sort of your your uh, typical white guy. <laughs> uh, speaking as a maybe not so typical white guy, but but it's sort of but it kind of. And, and we, of course, learned that, you know, that, that things are not as, as simple as they, they seem. Uh, in fact, this is a very, very complex family, not just culturally, but also because it deals with issues of um, mental health and wellness. And then increasingly, definitely by the time we get to the second book, with issues of sexuality. And so I thought both of the Darius books provide just a wonderful insight into multiple issues that maybe a lot more American young people are having to deal with today than, than not. So let me just start by saying, thanks for joining us again. Thank you so much for writing these amazing books. And Nazreen, I, I give you the chance to ask the first question. Um, yes, um, Adib, I'm just delighted with the way you created this character, this protagonist, who is, um, who has to shuttle between cultures, but the addition of the complexities of cultures within Iran, I also found amazing. So can you, I mean, I'd love to hear about how you started, what initiated this process of writing for you, um, the, the genesis of Darius, um, or Dariush novels. Sure. Um, growing up myself, Iranian American with a, a white mother and an Iranian father, um, I was never really connected to the Iranian side of my family because uh, after the revolution, most of them left Iran and moved to Vancouver, British Columbia. And so I grew up getting to see them in the summertime and the, for like a week or two. And then we would say goodbye and go back home to Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And I always felt this disconnect um, with that side of my heritage. And um, I think it's something that kind of grew in me. And as I grew older, I came to understand it better. And it was, I think 2015, I was visiting my family for Noru's, uh, the Iranian celebration of New Year. And I was trying to come up with a, an idea for a story that only I could tell um, because I think, you know, so much of what makes powerful stories is when we find something that only that only we can tell and I was like oh I'm surrounded by this big Iranian family of mine and I have very complicated feelings about heritage and living in diaspora why don't I try writing a book about that and it was the first time I'd ever tried writing a book about someone who wasn't white uh, this was right when the we need diverse books movement was uh, really gaining steam in the children's publishing world and so it was like my first time being like, oh, I'm allowed to tell stories about people like me. Kids like me are allowed to be heroes of our own stories. And so I very quickly went from wanting to write about an Iranian family to thinking, oh, well, I've never been to Iran, but I really wish I could go. Maybe I should write about going to Iran. And it was a way of kind of amplifying the, the feelings of familial disconnect I was feeling. Like what if instead of just going you know, to see them for the summer, it was literally the first time. So I think that's where most of it came from. That's great. Um, just quickly to say that I love the fact that you didn't choose the setting of Tehran, but yes, and 
just opened up for us, the Zoroastrian community, that uh, legacy, uh, their effect on Iranian culture and the Baha'i community. So just really wonderfully complex and rich. Well, thank, thank you, you. Jonathan. No, it's, it, I, I agree. I had read a lot about Iran, didn't really get, I think, a, a sort of much more granular sense until I read your books about the multiculturalism within Iran itself, uh, which I thought was absolutely wonderful. You also choose to layer into the story the uh, complication of mental health, uh, whereas it seems both Darius and his dad are suffering from sort of anxiety and depression. And I would love to know a little bit about what's at stake for you there, because certainly, as you know, a lot of young adult fiction, a lot of books for, for kids have a strong pedagogic component. They're, they're instructing in a way, they're, they're, they are teaching. And I'm wondering if, if this mental health component of the book and the fact that you're presenting a character who is dealing, and his dad dealing with mental health issues, um, feels like a pedagogic to you or something else. Interesting. I always feel like when I was growing up, I always hated any book that seemed to be teaching me something. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like my job as an author is to be much more subtle than that yeah. and uh, simply show different ways of examining the world. Mm. And, you know, if that, if that holds up a mirror to a young person's experience or um, kind of alters the way they see the world, maybe that's something that will be helpful or useful to them as they are developing uh, their prefrontal cortexes, which are, you know, obviously super important. Um, but as far as the mental health aspect, I grew up living with depression. I was diagnosed when I was like 12 or 13. And it's always just been part of my life and never particularly um, like a crisis, just, you know, something I lived with. And right around like 2013, 2014, and even into 2015, uh, I was reading a lot of young adult literature and I felt like there was this wave of books um, that all dealt with suicide that came out all around the same time. And some of them were about like revenge suicide and some of them were sort of romantic suicide. And some of them were about people who were like survivors of family members who had died by suicide. And I felt that it was kind of gross that that was the only mental health narrative that we were seeing mm -hmm. in books. And that may have, and that may have been partially my reading as well, but I don't think so. I and mean, I do think I do think suicide was just a trend for a while, as gross as it is to say that. And so I was very conscious of wanting to push back against that and just uh, put forward a different mental health narrative. And at the same time, I also, like I always had the feeling that no one would ever possibly want to read my book and that it was never going to get published. And so I was also like, well, why don't I just write about what I want to write about? And you know, who cares what the consequences are? Uh, so it still surprises me to this day that my book got published. <laughs> oh, I love it. I, I'm delighted your book got published. And I too was, when I was talking to Jonathan, as soon as I finished reading the book, I said, I found it so amazing and powerful that this character who is so young and is going through all these difficult moments in his life is also grappling with depression. So, I, I mean, of course, I always see myself as looking at it from, the perspective of our lives here in the US, but also another factor for me, an important factor was that in our Iranian communities, the way I grew up, depression was not something we talked about. And there was almost a taboo. It was sort of like, well, why can't you just get over it? So I found that really um, just moving. And the fact that the uh, father and the son shared this, was powerful to me. So I thought that was really important to also, I mean, I mean, you don't particularly maybe see it this way, but for me, it's like in the Iranian American community, we still really need to talk about mental health issues and um, not cover it over yeah. with niceties. Yeah. I would agree. Um, and my, my hope is, maybe it is a vain hope, um, vain as an egotistical, no, hopefully not vain as in like fruitless, but that as Iranian American or other children of diaspora find the book, it opens doors for them to talk with their family uh, in meaningful ways and hopefully 
dismantle the stigma around mental health. All of those are reasons why I, I, I use the word pedagogic before, but you have this far more eloquent way to, to characterize the work that you want your book to do in the world. So. I mean, I wouldn't go that far. Of the two of us, you're the one who used pedagogy in a sentence. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I, I just I'm owning the word. Speed, head empty. <laughs> I'm owning the word. So <laughs> the, the other dimension of it related to, to the characterization and representation of depression in the book is that we learn especially by the, by the second book that, that Darius is gay. And yet you, you unlink the depression and the gayness. He's, we learn he's depressed first. So that contrary to other YA books that talk more explicitly about sexuality and uh, queerness in particular, he is not depressed because he's gay, <laughs> which I thought was actually a really lovely way to handle that. Um, you know, depression is its own, is its own issue just as his sexuality is also going to be its own issue that he has to, to deal with. So I'd love to hear anything you want to say about the importance of representing um, alternate sexualities, queer sexualities in the context of a novel that is already doing a lot of really good work in representing uh, a, a sane and reasonable and appropriate, a healthy approach to depression. Oh, I don't know that I ever um, I don't know that I ever saw them as being like separate different issues mm -hmm. or even that I saw them as issues in general. I, I think I saw them as different facets of Darius's personality. And I think in, in real life as in fiction, there are times in life where different facets of us are having more of an impact on our day-to-day -day lives than at other times. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly with the first book, I was thinking about how when I was young, like all of my most important relationships were my friendships and the power that having friends that truly understand you uh, can have in your life. Yeah. And while I was kind of aware fairly early on in the process, as I was writing, I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure Darius is queer. Um, I very much did not want to write any sort of like forbidden gay romance set in Iran. I felt like mm -hmm. um, that just was, that wasn't interesting to me. Other people have done it and done it better than I could. Um, I'm a huge fan of Sarah Farazan's work and um, her book, If You Could Be Mine is heartbreaking and beautiful. Um, but that wasn't what I wanted to write about. I wanted to write about friendship, but I also know, at least I'm, I started having like gay thoughts when I was, I think about eight years old. And it took me a really long time to like figure out what those thoughts were. But looking back, I was like, oh yeah, I was like, I was definitely like, I definitely knew I was gay by eight. I just didn't have the vocabulary for it. And so I feel like whether Darius talked about it or not, um, his queerness impacts the way he moves through the world, uh, especially the way he interacts with other boys. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it, it was important for me to examine the way that that you know impacted him and then by the time the second book uh came around i found myself very interested in ex examining like what first relationships are like um especially when you're young and queer and the dating pool is sometimes small mm -hmm. um and the the ways that we sometimes i guess make compromises or don't know what else is out there don't know what to be looking for don't know what we really want. And I found myself really attracted to exploring those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've spiraled well away from your original question. Not, <laughs> so no, I apologize. Not, not at all, not at all. In <laughs> fact, I was gonna say, one of the things that I think is absolutely just beautiful about the first book is the relationship between Darius and Sorab, uh, the friend he makes uh, on his family's trip to Iran. And he was like, I want a Saurabh, you know, I mean, just such a beautiful, beautiful platonic friendship um, of openness, of, of real intimacy between these two boys that is, that is, is not sexual, right? This is real friendship, real intimate friendship. And I, and I, I just love those representations. I think, I think young, um, probably young American, young Iranian, young men in general need those representations of intimate friendship uh, that's non-threatening, 
right? That is beautiful, mm -hmm. mutually supportive, and really deeply caring. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, you drew upon um, uh, Iranian culture in the creation of those, in the creation of that friendship. Um, certainly, you know, as a as somebody who's only ever lived in the United States, I look at other cultures and sometimes see what I think of as a greater kind of intimacy between men that I don't assume is sexual. Um, but I'm wondering, is this, is this part, of, part of what allows you or prompted you, inspired you to, to create that portrait of friendship? I think so. There are different cultural imperatives about uh, how men can express platonic affection for each other in Iran and lots of other Southwest Asian countries. And uh, I've seen it kind of in my own family. Mm. Uh, and I was really interested in kind of the way that a different model of friendship would then intersect with Darius's own queerness. You know, growing up in America, seeing that kind of thing only really done romantically to suddenly have uh, just a platonic friend who was physically affectionate and uh, who was emotionally available, uh, what it would feel like and how it might be confusing, but also exhilarating. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it was definitely, it was definitely on my mind as I was writing. Yeah, it's really, really lovely, complex, uh, but, you know, for all of the complexity of the things we've been talking about, the, the book's accessibility are really amazing. So I want to make sure that Azreen has the, the final question. Uh, I just have to mention the tea, the passion <laughs> for tea, because so much of Iranian culture revolves around tea. And my husband is fond of saying, you sit around for hours drinking buckets of tea. So I loved what you did with tea. And it's not your typical Persian tea. So that, uh, I think I read somewhere that you have this love of tea yourself, right? Yeah. I do. So I was curious about that, it, but you made it your own. So it's, it can't be read in isolation as though, oh, all Iranians drink tea. <laughs> right. I, my love of tea definitely started with my family and with, uh, with the Iranian love of tea. Whenever I visited any of my relatives house, the kettle was always on and as I grew older, I began kind of exploring more of the world of tea and going to tea festivals and tea tastings and just, I don't know, seeing what all was out there. And as an adult, I also have grown to enjoy wine as well. And there's a lot of intersections between fine tea and fine wine, fine wine. But uh, as I was writing the book, I found myself thinking about how uh, when I was young and when I think most people are young, we have these interests of ours that are, are sometimes a little uh, odd or unusual um, and that sometimes other people don't get, but we can be knowledgeable and passionate about them uh, in ways that adult, adults don't always take seriously. And I found myself wanting to kind of honor that in, in young people and saying, and in presenting a character who in fact really did know his stuff in a lot of ways, uh, even if people didn't always understand it. So also as a just a really fun excuse to drink a lot of tea as I was writing for research purposes. <laughs> right. I Thank love you. It. That's a great note on which to end. We've been talking with Adib Karam and my colleague Nazreen Rahime. Uh, Adib is the author of Darius the Great is Not Okay and its sequel, Darius the Great Deserves Better. Adib, thank you so much. And Nazreen as well. We appreciate you both. Thank you. Thank you so much thank for having me. Much.